new Tynecastle Stadium provided the ideal theatre as the drama of season 95-96 unfolded. Supporters of the club have long grown weary of false dawns, and yet as they both despaired and rejoiced, ultimately they could be satisfied by the progress achieved by the new manager in his first season in charge. Well, obviously, I knew coming into the, the club that uh, you know, Hearts had a couple of bad years. I mean, going to the last game of the season uh, to avoid relegation, I know the Premier League is very tight, and you know, one or two results can put, keep you in down there and lack of confidence. But really, a club of this uh, standing shouldn't they have to fight down there at the, the bottom of the league, and you know, with a lot of work to do. And that work began in earnest with the start of the league campaign. Early in September, Geoffrey's former club Falkirk visited Tynecastle. Alan Lawrence pounced on a pass from Alan Johnson to open the scoring. Seven minutes later, and it was 2-0. The ball played forward to Robertson. Back to Hamilton, and his pass for John Cahoon. Converted in some style by the veteran striker. Cahoon picking his spot behind Neil Ingalls. Alan Johnson really was in magic form for Hearts. Watch this mazy run. And it led to goal number three. A perfect cross for John Cahoon. The header. Hearts fourth came to the penalty spot. Leaks through to Lawrence. No question about that decision. Penalty kick. A yellow card for Ingalls. And John Robertson rounding off a great day for Jim Jeffries against his old club. Defeats at the hands of Thistle and Celtic and an exit from the Coca-Cola Cup followed that month. In October, Hearts went to Easter Road. It was strange because obviously my first derbies as a manager and the first one was that we'd come off a bad de defeat with Celtic and we had to go and play Hibs and I felt we played uh, very well. So just uh, under five minutes of the first half left. Still no scoring, here come Hartswich, Robertson clipping it across, McPherson's there! And David McPherson scores for Hearts! Looking at the far post and picking his spot beyond Jim Layton, old John Robertson, who is always such a thorn on this hip side, providing the cross, and David McPherson not picked up. Again, the sends that one through, it's Gareth Evans, and then comes the substitute, and Graham Donald scores the equaliser. Well played by Anil, that's what he's better at, and uh, Keith Wright is certainly on side. It's right. Taking on Winnie, teeing it up. And Pat McGinley scores for Habanian. We were leading 1-0 uh, and, and we're comfortable, and then again our lapses came back and we were 2-1 down, but John Robertson has done in the past, it popped up with a great goal in the very last kick of the game, and, and we've got a point that we thoroughly deserved on that occasion. And Robertson's inside the penalty area. And against the Bernie, and anything's likely to happen. There's Robertson getting a little touch. Robertson trying to get in the shot! Oh, he's done it! It's unbelievable from John Robertson! He's done it again, and he's set a new record. That's his 23rd goal against the Bernie. And it's a new record for John Robertson. 184 league goals. He overtakes that other Hearts great will evolve in the most dramatic circumstances here at Easter Road. Well, he's punished hips down through the years. He got in a little touch there with his head. The ball broke back to him. There didn't seem to be any way through. But then he found the opening. In Robber's own words after that game, it's not over till the fat striker scores. And he proved that he still had what it took to score consistently in the Premier Division, even in his 32nd year. Nipper Lawrence concluded the scoring for Hearts against Wraith Rovers with his second goal. A wonderful strike to secure a 4-2 victory. Only one win and four defeats in October left the club in a perilous position. It was coming in, there was obviously the euphoria and we let things ride along. And, but it, it came back and we, you know, after nine games we ended the bottom of the league and it looked like a, a long hard struggle. So the change that I thought would need to happen um, before I got the job then we just had to get on with it and uh, you know we know the resources at the club are not uh, that good at the moment, but I knew that before we, we took over. So there had to be a lot of change, really, and sometimes in the short term, uh, just to get uh, people to realise that that's what had to be done.
With limited resources and having inherited a somewhat aging squad, Jim Jeffries and assistant manager Billy Brown had the unenviable task of breathing new life into the team while struggling for survival at the bottom of the table. In the wake of the Bosman ruling, Jeffries cast his net wide and drafted an experienced French keeper, Gilles Rousset. The next recruit for his foreign legion was the uncompromising former Serie A hardman, Pascal Bruno. The manager's most daring move was to blood some of the youngsters already at the club. Among them, Paul Ritchie, Alan McManus and Alan Johnson. I felt looking at the youngsters in the, in the club and I, you know, I, was, I was hinted that the Murray weren't good enough. And um, I found that strange because when they were young kids, and OK, there's no guarantee that they can go in and play in the first team, but when you look at them as, uh, as a group, they won the BP Cup, they won the Reserve League title, so they couldn't have been that bad. And OK, maybe their form did dip, but maybe if you've been two or three years, I've learned that you take players and if they're two or three years in the reserves and don't get any light in the tunnel, they need a fresh challenge. They've mastered, they've, they've won the reserve league title. They're, they see that there's maybe not a chance of them getting through to the, the first team and therefore, you know, they, they, they lose a wee bit of a confidence or a wee bit of hope in themselves. So we gave them a challenge. We said, you know, we know the resources, we're going to make change. If it doesn't work out, we've lost nothing because we're not successful anyway. But here's a chance and you've had a bit of a kick in the teeth early in your career, so I'll give you that opportunity. So you go and show what you can do. And we started with the changes we're making, Gary Locke, who was a very popular lad about the club with the older players and great respect for him. Uh, a die-hard jambo and plays like he does in training and uh, I have a lot of time for him. And I thought he was... Uh, I thought, well, he's a tailor-made captain for me and even I think he can handle it at an early age. And, there's a wee bond between the young boys as well, you know, and, it, and it's great, and the, the older players have responded to that as well. So, you know, we've given them a chance, and we said they would stick by them. And I think if you, if they've got a manager and a backroom staff who believe in them, and uh, they've went out there and they've grabbed the opportunity, and, and they've turned out to be great. Jim also drafted in Hans Eskelson, another foreign import, for the first game of November at home to Partick Thistle. Coming off bad defeats to Rangers in Falkirk, supporters were looking for a victory from the new-look Hearts side. The first goal came courtesy of the Jags, after a Johnson ball was backheeled by Robertson to be met by Thistle's Derek McWilliams, who slotted the ball into his own net. The second came from a corner kick. Johnson lofted the ball into the area and John Miller got the vital touch. A determined John Robertson somehow found his way through the Thistle defence to contrive a third goal from nothing. As the ball broke, Eskelson was there to stroke home a debut goal. Hibs were about 15 points in front of us. And uh, I said that we had been improving, but I said this would, this would be a great game to win because I felt if we won that game, I think we could have then... Uh, made Hibs a target as far as overtaking the league and it proved, proved to be and uh, you know I thought we could have been two or three up at half time but Hibs came back at us and we did, it took a penalty but I think that again was a, a, a victory that was deserved. Eskilson, little lock. some movement ahead. Evans has gone to the right. Jackson inside left position. Here's Chris Jackson. Good running. Chris Jackson going all the way himself. It's a great goal by Jackson. He equalised over Hibbs. Chris Jackson's first goal of the season. Here's Steve Fulton now with this free kick. John Miller's a big threat. Very good near. Stephen Tweed did well. Poor clearance attempt by O'Neill. Lock. Penalty kick's given. Ball by Mullen. Oh, I don't think Gary Lock would have caught the ball before the byline, but the penalty kick has been given. You'll always get a result if you go and attack defenders and that. And really, it's 
taking the ball past him, and I don't think Andy Bull's got enough thought to complain about it because he's wrong footed him, he slid in when the ball's go, going behind him, and I think the referee's right. Here comes Robertson. No answer to that. The power was too much for Leighton. John Robertson's penalty goal sealed another memorable victory over Hibbs to kickstart Hearts League fight back. Over the years, there have been many crucial victories over Hearts City rivals. In the late 80s, the Jambos began an unparalleled series of games without defeat against Hibernian, which spanned six seasons and 22 matches. We will return to current action in due course. But for the moment, sit back and enjoy some unforgettable moments from the archives. A celebration of some of the games and the goals from that magnificent undefeated run. Unfortunately, during that the time I supported the club that Hibs came out on top and then inf infamous 7 nothing defeat at Tyne Castle here. Uh, but since I, I've been with the club, I've been very fortunate that we've had some fabulous games against them and more often than not, we've came out on top. You know, I've been a heart supporter and, and, and player and, as I say, I know the rivalry well there. And uh, it was no different if, it, you know, your feeling as a manager is you're going to play when you're out there. At least when you're a player, you can go out there and do something about it. But, Great games to play in. So the head free kick. It'll be taken by Neil Orr. Right to the far post. Up goes Houchin! around the box with Ian Ferguson the main threat Bannon also deadly with these swerving free kicks five in the wall Bannon leaves it there's Ferguson now Bannon Somebody's told me it's my 150th first team goal, so 
it's a double celebration and obviously the fans will enjoy it more than anything else. It's more spice for, because you're in Edinburgh, lad. You know, it's, this is a big match as far as we're concerned, myself, Gary McKay, and equally Eddie May and Paul Kane especially. You know, it's a big game for us boys. We're all born and bred in Edinburgh. It was a fixture which also featured those from further afield. Good swing in, Paul, that's a goal. Lucevic. The Yugoslav. Cleanly in. And no wonder the goalkeeper's annoyed about that. Pushref Muzemic, dubbed Moose by fans, scored the winner in his one and only derby match after joining the club for £200,000 from Red Star Belgrade. Having been a prolific scorer in Yugoslavia, he never quite adapted to the hardly burly of Scottish football. Do you fear that the skills and the creativity, to a large extent, is being knocked out of the game? Mm. Unfortunately, in the Premier League, I mean, I suppose I'm biased because I play in midfield, but really... I mean, if you get one touch or two touch in midfield, uh, you're lucky. And today was a perfect example of that. You're really just, you're helping the ball on. It lands on your feet and you, you haven't got time to bring it down and to do something with it. There are exceptions. Uh, Paul McStay probably is the best at creating a yard or two for himself. But generally speaking, it's, the Premier League is a very, very difficult league to play in from a midfield point of view and from a forward's point of view too. Uh, and that's a pity, I think. It's not really... If you're a purist, I don't think you would enjoy the football played in the Premier League, generally speaking. It is perhaps true of all derbies that skill and subtlety are sacrificed in the fire and fury of the occasion. Nonetheless, with pride at stake and the passion of the supporters at fever pitch, it can make for scintillating entertainment. Breaking on the right for Hearts. And a beautifully timed tackle again from Neil Cooper. Here's Cahoon. Now Foster. Pulling it back for Bannon. 32 minutes gone. The Hearts fans go wild as Eamon Bannon gives his team the lead. Cahoon did well. Sidestepping away there. Neil Cooper, the shot ricocheting there into the path of Foster. This is a great pullback by Foster. Bannon coming in, Gorham going to touch, but he couldn't keep it out. And Hearts are in front. Well, Bannon's second goal of the season. And that's free kick which Hibbs have taken quickly. There's Mitchell looking for Archibald. McPherson, turned on by Cahoon, but could survive. And then again by Kirkwood. Dave McCurry turning it back well for Cahoon. John Robertson, Robertson again! John Robertson at his best. Kane and Archibald setting up this free kick. foremost and same in any game you want the team to win you want the team to perform well uh, there's a lot of games a lot of derby matches that I've played and that I've not performed uh, as well as I would like but I've been happy at the end of the game because the team's won uh, and I think that's the main thing in football it is a team game Waterweed is a great This was Foster to Gary Mackay. Now Mackay tries to play the one-two here, and Cooper just stays in his path. 
That was a bad foul by Cooper. Robertson. question of what makes them special games and it's the expectations of the supporters and the pressure the sports put on players all week people talk about the game and um, more than any other game even than Rangers and Celtic and it's sad but true that the supporters would would rather you beat Hibs four times and then got beat four times and had a better league campaign but that's just the way people are because they don't want to go into work on a Monday morning and and take the stick and the, the abuse from the, the, the workmates that are perhaps Hibs supporters. It is unfortunate that on occasion the game has been marred by crowd trouble as the frustration of supporters boils over. However, it is always what happens on the park that remains the major talking point. Robertson's in there. Robertson doing well. And the deflection, it's a goal for Hearts! Oh, what a disaster for Hibbs. John Robertson playing the ball into the middle. What a record this little man has of causing trouble for Hibs. Andy Gorham looking quite disconsolate. 12 minutes on the clock. And John Robertson cutting into the penalty area. Flipping the ball forward and deflected into the net. Cahoon, Mackay, George Wright. And into the far post, McKinley coming in. It's headed behind by Willie Miller. Corner kick to Hearts. And Big Levine going forward along with Alan McLaren. And John Robertson going over to take this one. In fact, uh, leaving it now to John Cahoon. Big Levine there. Points for the cross. Levine with the header and the ball in the net. And it's John Robertson, I think, getting the final touch. Set by a powerful header from Craig Levine. Right through the hip defence. Robertson was working there. 24 minutes on the clock. The Bernie nil, Hearts 2. And Andy Gorham can't quite believe it. Well, Levine was in plenty of space. The high ball played right across the face of the box. Was there, whether he got the nearest touch. Except by Levine will probably claim that one. Lee Sanderson to Cahoon, to Mackay. Stringing the passes together. George Wright. Away though by Gordon Hunter. So Hart's keeping on the pressure. Cahoon, good ball through to Foster. He's got Robertson in the middle. Good Robertson! What a goal by Hart! Oh, that was magnificent play. Build some play. Graham Mitchell. Away by Sanderson. Hamilton with the drive and a magnificent save by Henry Smith.
By November 1990, Hibs were becoming increasingly anxious about their failure to beat their rivals. On this meeting, they opened the scoring with a goal from Keith Houchen. However, the joy turned to despair as John Calhoun, ploughing a familiar furrow down the right, whipped in a cross, which was spectacularly met by Robin. Neil Berry popped up to meet the rebound and secure his place in the hearts of the Tynecastle faithful. Favourite one for myself was the one that we won 4-1 at Easter Road. I think it was the first time that Sky had shown a live game, a live Scottish game, and we went down to Easter Road under Joe Jordan's manager, and we won 4-1. As is often the case in such matches, league form was no indicator of the outcome of these games. Despite some indifferent performances under manager Joe Jordan that season, the site had still inflicted three convincing victories over Hibs. Perhaps the most memorable and satisfying of those came as the festive season was drawing to an end. Here's Gary Mackay. Clearance by Milne. Now Cahoon is in behind Milne, releasing the ball early. And it's fell in by Tosh McKinley. Andy Gorham was unsighted, there's no doubt about that. But Tosh McKinley scores his first goal of the season and hearts are ahead. Well, there doesn't look any danger at all, does it, when the ball arrives at Tosh McKinley's foot? But I think it is Andy Gorham is unsighted. I think Willie Miller has lifted his foot up. I can't understand why he didn't try and block it, Willie Miller. If you just watch very carefully, he just lifts his leg over it. And that doesn't help his goalkeeper at all. So referee Duncan ensuring that the hips wall retreats the required distance. It's a four in the wall. Dave McPherson up with the attack, so is Craig Levine. Cahoon leaves it to Crab. Chance for McPherson on the turn. Hearts are two ahead. And once again, Andy Gorham was rooted to the spot. Oh, what an incredible goal for Hearts since McPherson's third of the season. Once again, you can only fault the defending from Hibbs. They've had opportunities to clear it, but Dave McPherson just turns and the deflection does nothing for Andy Gorham, does it? Yes, and I think the tide is turning against them. They've had 10 or 15 minutes now where they haven't really troubled the Hearts' defence and they caused them all sorts of problems in the first half hour. And I think Alec Miller will be quite happy now to get his team in the dressing room at half-time just to get them G'd up again and set them out for the second half. Gorham coming out to challenge with a the header, there's Gary Mackay, and Hearts have scored a third. Well, the Hearts fans are jubilant, Andrew Gorham cannot believe this. Well, it certainly must be called an error of judgment by Gorham. Well, certainly the flight of the ball deceives him. I'm sure Andy Gorham's coming out to catch that, realises he's going to be out of sight the box, but what composure from Gary Mackay. Kane forward, and there's Paul Kane again, he has Brian Hamilton going through the middle. Have to time the flash properly, he's onside all right. Hamilton returning it for Kane, and it's an own goal by Gary Mackay. And you wonder if that was the only way in which him would score. Well, it's quite incredible, isn't it, Joe? They can't even get the joy of scoring a goal themselves. Gary Mackay, who had chased all the way back. What more has this game got in store for this job? Good play by McPherson, there's Houchin back defending. And a great goal by Levine. What a magnificent volley by Craig Levine. It's not one of the aspects of Levine's game for which he's renowned, but what a great finish this is. Well, he don't mind losing his feet, Jock, when there's a goal like this involved. I mean, there's nothing happening, it's a bit of a scramble. Hearts get in a bit of a mix-up there, but what a volley this is from Craig Levine, as you say, not noted for his finishing, but I'll bet he'll remember this for a long, long time. I had the misfortune to score at the Hibs end, but uh, I had the Hearts end rather, but also scored against them that day, so we won 4-1, and Scott Crabb and myself, Scott, who's now with Dundee United, uh, went out and had a, a couple of drinks after the game to celebrate a, another famous victory at Easter Road. 
When it comes to scoring against Hibbs, there is one man who is the undisputed king of hearts. Oh, getting up well. There's Robertson! <laughs> Typical finishing from Robertson. Hard to the head in just four minutes. Evans looking for Weir, the marker is right, that's a killer's one, here's Keith Rats! Heads up back on level terms! The New Year's Day game of 1992 was extremely significant for Joe Jordan's heart side. While looking to extend their unbeaten run to 12 games, Hearts also had the opportunity to claim the top place in the league, above Rangers, at the midway stage of the season. As usual, it was a game full of controversy and incident, with a number of talking points after the dust had settled. and they're hunting a crucial goal here with Tortolano oh and McLaren nearly an own goal is it in? it must be it well David Syme has ruled out another one an amazing episode right on the line well, Hibbs looking more and more dangerous as the game goes on. A terrific little ball in here. McLaren slides in, knocks off his stomach. Smith lets it slips out his hand a little bit. Well, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't see a great deal along with that. Was it, it must handball? Have been, must have been difficult for the referee to see it in front of all those bodies. Treated the game as Joe Jordan has been saying, as though it was a European tie. And here is Ferguson! What an arrival! And really against the run of play, Hearts have snatched the lead in the most dramatic fashion. Ian Ferguson sent on to try and pick things up, and how well he's done it. Well, not a bad substitution here. I mean, it's a long free kick. We were talking about Ferguson's aerial ability when he came on. But Ferguson flicks it on, but it's actually a great right foot half volley here that comes again Hart's way. Terrific finish. Long punt into the penalty box. Good flick on from David McPherson. Just goes over the back of the defender's head here. Just waits on it, times it lovely. And a terrific right foot shot right under the top of the net. Well, it's his second goal for Hearts. Weir could be in for an equaliser straight away. It's a great stop by Henry Smith. A magnificent save. To snatch the equaliser away from Mickey Weir. Well, I can tell you time and time again this has happened this season. Henry Smith having an absolutely magnificent season. You might have expected Mickey Weir to finish that, that one. Well, Tommy McIntyre came through the difficulties of taking a penalty in the Skull Cup final and he scored at a crucial stage against Dunfermline but if anything this is more nerve-wracking it's McIntyre he's rolled it into the corner and totally deceived Henry Smith 1-1 well it is often the goal scorers who make the headlines there are often others whose heroics are decisive Darren Jackson, oh, a terrific save by Henry Smith. Oh, Darren Jackson coming so close to his first goal for Hibernian. Great leap there, and what a save from Smith. Well, Van de Ven, who's just come back into the side after injury, took away the penalty. Oh, Henry Smith does it again. That is magnificent goalkeeping. Well, Brian Hamilton hit the kick with plenty of power but Smith well two tremendous saves in the opening stages 
Jackson against Levine and Benton behind him. Mickey Weir running through the middle. What oh, tremendous run by Weir. He must score. Smith has done it again. And now there to Mackay. This is Van der Ven. Now Derek Ferguson. Robertson playing it on this pitch. Again, Hibs have left three players on the halfway line, Jackson, Weir and Evans. Forcing Hearts to think about that. Mitchell's head up. Hibs setting themselves for a counter-attack and they can get possession again. But it's back with John Robertson. Season 93-94 started with an early encounter with Hibbs. Justin Fashioner, whose personal life attracted more attention than his footballing ability, began a move which was continued by John Colhoun. The ball broke to Gary Locke, who had time to look up and find Alan Johnson in the box. Johnson, who had come on as a substitute, immediately endeared himself to half supporters. The exciting thing about the goal was that uh, one of our young lads, Gary Locke, uh, supplied a great cross, and Alan Johnson, um, who the lads here are starting to call Magic Johnson uh, because of his ability, um, pulled the ball down in the box, uh, cut inside and, and lashed into the top corner. It's a special game for us. The ground's always full and there's always a great atmosphere. And there's never any football played, but I mean, it's the nature of the derby games all over the world. And um, they are exciting games. I've scored two in, against Hibs on a couple of occasions. One from the, the farthest I've ever kicked the ball, it was over 30 yards. It's the farthest I've ever kicked the ball, so that was satisfying. You've got to earn the right to play in most games, but in the Derby game, it's really just frenetic and uh, played at such a high tempo and a high pace that there isn't really any time for football. It's usually a physical encounter, and occasionally you'll get one thrown up. This is a classic game, but um, not in the way a football played, I don't think, because there is so much at stake. a lot of games because we've had such a good run and you always remember the, the good times rather than the bad times. And Wayne Foster's winner against um, Hibs in the Scottish Cup um, was special because we had been outplayed for long spells in the game but at that time we seemed to be able to do that to them, be outplayed and then come up and sneak a winner. Roberts' layoff looking for Cahoon. Good play by McKinley, Robertson's onside. Well, that's a good play by Robertson, and a very fine block by Jim Layton. His first serious save of the match. Hart's last game in their run ended in a goalless draw. It was their 22nd game without defeat. Some precedent in the City Derby that I know of to go that amount of games without, uh, without a defeat. Um, and it was, but the, the, the funny thing was it was really 
hit them really hard when they actually beat us. Um, which was strange after 22 years of thinking, you know, well, it had to happen sometime. But, um, but that's just the nature of supporters in these derby games. But it was a fantastic run. And, but we used to get known that, that we wouldn't get beaten. They used to get known that they couldn't win. And uh, psychology plays a big part in football. And, and it is a huge thing, but it's ended now, and every game is just a typical derby game now. And it's impossible to predict. Everybody says that it's a cliche that um, you, you don't know what way it's going to go, and the form goes out the window. All those cliches are, are, are true um, because it's, it's just what happens in the day. To go that length of derbies in any derbies is, is, is fantastic, and uh, that's something you can't take away from them. So the club can be proud of that, that record, and uh, hopefully we can start off and maybe try and beat that record and make it. 22, uh, equal or 22 or even better at some day, but uh, you know, uh, it's going to be a difficult one to beat. Turning to the action from more recent times, season 95-96 continued towards the turn of the year with manager Jim Jeffries facing an uphill struggle. The achievement, first of all, was turning around, turning around the, the run of bad results that we had up till November. The fact that we were sitting virtually bottom in the league in November uh, is forgotten when you do as well between then and the end of the season. But the manager turned it around with the personnel uh, that he brought in and also the lads that were already here. After the first quarter, you know, as I said, we're sitting at the bottom of the league and second, uh, the, the uh, second quarter showed that the, the changes coming in, we started to get a lot of improvement. Hearts began to play an exciting brand of football, with the blend of young and old, homegrown and imported players beginning to produce results. In particular, Hearts' young captain excelled in the role. The season has just went uh, from good to better this season for myself, and uh, but at the start of the year, I'd just been happy to get myself back into the team on a regular basis, but to be made captain is an extra bonus for me. There was no doubt that the youngsters benefited from the experience of the more mature players. In particular, John Robertson continued to set a good example. He would go on to become top scorer for the 13th of his 14 seasons with the club. Brought one or two different players in, um, and the young kids got a chance, and, and people split the team into three compartments last season. It was the, the older lads like myself and Davey and Gary and John, um, and then the, the young kids like Paul and Gary Locke and Alan Johnson, and then you had the foreigners. But it wasn't really to do with, with three compartments, to do with everybody pulling together as a team, and I think we got the best out of our ability last year. It was a squad that had been here a long time, and a bit aging, if you like, um, and we've had to try and change that round. And because you've always got to have a balance with, with the youngsters, and, and also you've got to have room for your experienced players as well. So we've managed to do that. I think we've, you know, we've got a lot of fresh legs about the place. I like to one or two experienced players. Um, that's a good blend. Young Alan Johnson was proving to be a revelation, beginning to turn on the magic more consistently. With a regular first-team place, his confidence increased, and he excited supporters with his dazzling talents. A uh, big difference for last year. The um, gaffers gave us a bit of confidence and says if we play well, we'll keep our place. I think that's been a major difference. He just says no matter what age you are, if you do well, you'll be in the first team. And he stuck by his words. John Calhoun also benefited from Jim Jeffries' intuitive understanding of players in the game, as he revelled in a more direct role. After the last season, I, I was pushed through the middle after I did uh, quite well coming on against Aberdeen, and I, I'm really enjoying that. I was becoming a, a bit um, staid and a bit stale, playing out wide, because after so many years in the Premier League, people, um, defenders are not that daft, they realise what's happening and, and what you like to do, but going through the middle, I can use a little bit of what I've learned over the years. 
and I'm really enjoying my football. And I'm, I've got another year here, and I'm just going to take it as it comes. I'm, I'm enjoying it just now, but when I stop enjoying it, then hopefully I'll be able to stop playing. Despite a New Year's Day defeat to Hibs, the Jambos began to chalk up victories where before they had stumbled. Alan McManus scored with a brave header at Fir Hill to take the points and avenge an earlier defeat there. The season was now entering its most crucial phase for Hearts. But I always said that the third quarter would be the most important one. And in that third quarter we had five, our last seven fixtures in that quarter, we had five at home. And you know, a league as tight as this, you know, there's a lot of draws can, can be thrown up. But we actually um, won a lot of matches, particularly in that period. And, and obviously a big difference with picking up three as opposed to, what, to one point. So really, you know, when I looked at it and said, well, five of those games at home, if we get the lion's share of points, then that would be great. I think um, like when I first came here, the, the, the club we were right down the bottom, so we were. And uh, I don't think there was a lot of optimism about the way the things were going. Then the, the foreigners come in, and like, things have just seemed to gel. And like, I think we we just lacking a bit of confidence. Like when I, I came to the club, and it, like, we're getting the wins. You know what I mean? But we, like, we feel confident we can go out and win every game. And the only place we came unstuck was in those home matches with Celtic when we led 1-0 with 14 minutes to go and we lost it. And uh, we were a bit disappointed about that because you know, we had Rangers in the full Saturday, but you know, football's a funny thing. We go to, to Ibrox and play the best we've played this year and, and get a 3-0 victory, so that evened up. It was Neil Poynton with the header. Couldn't quite direct it towards Colhoun, but John Colhoun is battling away. He's beaten Petrich. Lawrence inside, Johnston making ground in the middle. Return pass, Colhoun again. 
It's come back. Alan Johnston has scored. Seven minutes gone. And Hearts have shocked the Rangers' support with the opening goal. It's Alan Johnston. He's been in superb form. And the Rangers' defence won't be happy about this at all. It was sluggish stuff from Petrich. The Hoon got the second chance. It is cut back. Tucked away by Johnston. had opportunities to clear here but John Calhoun was going to make them pay and Johnston took the chance they call him magic at time castle forward from Poynton Johnston through the middle he's done it again it's Johnston's second and out of almost nothing Hearts have struck blow number two the Hearts fans jubilant their team is two up it was played through by Neil Poynton in behind Ian Ferguson was Alan Johnston the Rangers defence lost him and that was a superb finish he's highly thought of is Alan Johnston and with that sort of cool finish Grim faces on the Rangers bench, a team really being vastly outplayed at the moment. McLaren against Cahoon, McLaren wins. They used to be teammates. Now uh, Charlie Miller. What could Ian Ferguson do? Gordon Judy forced to come back looking for the ball in recent times he's been getting an excellent service and making the most of it too there's Poynton through the middle Alan Johnston can he score his hat-trick what a moment for the youngster Johnston he's done it a superb finish from Alan Johnston and Hart's victory over Rangers is surely now complete the Hart's players celebrate Celebrations on the Hearts bench as well. And Alan Johnston has a hat trick he will long remember. Hooked forward from Poynton. Yet again, Johnston eluding his marker. Bags of time. He made the most of it. He went round Gorham and he tucked it away. Well, the Hearts fans won't mind seeing this one again. But look at the room Johnston was given through the middle of that Rangers defence. But look at the cool head as well here for a 22-year-old. The Rangers fans heading for the exits already. They've seen enough. Their team three down. And Alan Johnston that day put on a, an individual performance that will be very, very difficult for anybody to match uh, at Ibrox. Uh, everything he, he done was, it was sheer class. and That was probably the game that propelled him into the, the limelight. Uh, and it was thoroughly deserved because he was superb but overall the team played really well that day and he was the he was really nice in the cake as far as his individual performance was concerned we got the thing right on the day i mean it's always a difficult place and rangers are capable of scoring three and four and five goals that we know against you so to, to go there you know there's obviously a lot more pressure on rangers who are going for the title and things like that but um you know we're going there with a bit of confidence we played well as i say against celtic in the midweek and we were determined to try and get something out of the game there but the way we set the team up, everybody played uh, according to plan. And, uh, you know, then we had an individual performance from Alan Johnson uh, getting the three goals. But it was a real team effort. And, uh, you know, you've got to look back in that game and say, you know, the score didn't flatter us in any way. And we could have scored uh, a few more. But, uh, as I say, we'll not be greedy in, in, in that day. We thoroughly deserved our victory. So it was nice. And, it, you know, because Hearts haven't got a good record at Ibrox. So it was, it was, again, pleasing to give the supporters something to, to go home and cheer at last uh, after a lot of disappointments at Ibrox. If the scoreline wasn't a true reflection, it was because we hadn't scored enough. We outplayed them that day and we outfought them and um, we outthought them and it was very satisfying. But um, when it comes down to it, they ended up first in the league and we ended up fourth and, and that's, that tells the story of the whole season.
what you're looking for over the course of the season and what we did achieve from November was a level of consistency that we're hoping to match this year. Uh, and that's, that's the only way ahead for the club is achieving a level of consistency as an individual and as a team. The progress on the park continued with two consecutive victories over Kilmarnock. Having beaten them 2-1 in the fourth round of the Scottish Cup, they repeated that feat one week later with a 2-0 league victory. John Colquhoun and John Robertson were the scorers. Every time we started to get really wee ch signs were coming when near the end of the season we, we got people like Colin Cameron to go in there and based on the success we had in the, in the Scottish Cup and, and getting to the final. Having defeated St Johnson and Aberdeen to reach the Scottish Cup final, Hearts faced Cup final opponents Rangers in a league clash. A spectacular strike from Neil Poynton put Hearts ahead in the game inevitably tagged a dress rehearsal for the final itself. The second goal was scored by that thorn in Rangers flesh, Magic Johnson. Hearts became the only side, apart from Juventus, to beat Rangers home and away that season. The followed a visit to Starks Park and another convincing victory from Jim Jeffrey's men. New signing Colin Cameron opened the scoring with a simple tap-in after popping up in the box to take advantage of slight defending by Wraith. Neil Poynton pounced on a loose ball in the edge of the area and buried his drive in the corner of the net. Gary Mackay struck a memorable free-kick goal to celebrate his 600th appearance in a Hearts jersey. As the season came to a close, the only issue to be decided was that of who would claim third spot. A one-all draw with Aberdeen meant the Jambos finished joint third with the Dons. When you consider when you've got all these changes and, and things to do, I think if you said that we'd finish third equal uh, and, and in a Scottish Cup final, and the way we were playing and the way the team was shaping, we've got to be delighted with, with that first season. Um, as I say, particularly when the first quarter we were, was, was sitting at the bottom of the league. So, please, but and we've got to use that as a springboard to, to go on this year and, and try and uh, do a bit better than we, than we did last year. There were disappointments, with a stinging defeat to Rangers in the Cup final, and, in an illustration of the struggle Hearts must continually face, the loss of Alan Johnson to France. I think it's even more difficult for a club like Hearts, who've nurtured his talents, and then within the space of probably a year, really, when he... He came into the first team and was a focal point in the first team. Within a year, he's then departed the scene. Uh, the only positive aspect to come out of last season, as far as the youngsters were concerned, apart from their performances, is the fact that Richie McManus and Gary Locke, who's sadly injured just now, they have secured their futures with the club. And that gives the club a good basis to work on over the next two or three years. As the club begin a new season, Jim Jeffrey's efforts to build a team which can challenge for top honours continues. In an effort to find the balance that is needed to mount an effective campaign, he has proved his prudence and good judgment in the transfer market, with the acquisition of talented winger Neil McCann from Dundee. Yeah, well, it's a while since, um, since Hearts have played with a left-sided player, a left-sided winger, and so there will be a different uh, sort of balance to the team when he plays. Um, but he's exciting, he's quick, he, he runs at people. When he runs at people and does it very, very early, he's, um, he's most dangerous. Alan Johnson was the type that excited the people when he was on his game, and he, you know you, you could get supporters, you could see them getting off their seats when something he was, you know, he could create something out of nothing. And Neil McCann's exactly the same. I think he's shown that he's, he's a player that can excite the people and he can unlock defences, and he's got a skill and pace, uh, great left foot crosses the ball well and uh, so you know plenty of opportunities to learn the chances for us there now we've got to capitalise on the, the, the outfield play that he that he can give us so very pleased with that signing and you know the, the bonus is that he's only 21 as well so uh, lots of hope for he has a good career with Hearts. Well I've tried to, to balance the whole uh, club you know there, there wasn't a lot of uh, midfield players for instance and we've, we've tried to strengthen that area which is quite difficult but uh, players like uh, David Weir, 
you know, who's doing extremely well, Colin Cameron, who's come in, Neil McCann, you know, these are relatively young lads, and, uh, you know, it, it bodes well for the future. The season has begun with Jeffries and Brown continuing to strive for the blend that will yield results. Already the signs are promising that that goal is within reach. Here as well, forward gets a touch. Again, David Weir is up there to see if he can cause some problems. The goalkeeper's under pressure, and that's gone in. Well, this is incredible. 14 minutes gone, two goals in the space of a couple of minutes. A complete miscue there. Chances on for Cameron. One of Gemini's aims at Berwick, Falkirk, and, and since we've come here, is to try and get the team play, playing attractive football. And if you play attractive football, you know, you get crowds in and people support you. And uh, you'll find that uh, that will come out in your favour in the end. And People enjoy it better, there's a better spirit in the club. And uh, our aim is just to keep on uh, progressing. And we just hope that we can put hearts where they should be, and that's challenging for every major runner we possibly can. Fulfillment of the management's ambitions is something that they know can only be achieved with the continued backing of the supporters. We're always looking for quality players. We're, we're starting to look further afield now in terms of the European market as well. And we've already done that with Rusi and, and Bruno and, uh, and at this present moment uh, another Italian who's in a short term come. Hopefully he'll uh, work out and we can have him on a longer term basis. But um, it's to stick right behind us because it's far more encouraging to play with a big heart support behind us, actually supporting the team. This club's been knocked a lot in the last 10 years and uh, rightly so because of the, the fact that, um, you know, the disappointments that they've had. And what's helped is there's been a lot of upheaval at boardroom level and what have you. And we've been in the press for a lot of the wrong reasons. So hopefully last year, as I say, we're in the press for a lot of the right reasons and we want to continue that and give people in the papers and and the media and everything to shout about for things we're doing on the park and, and uh, the one way to help that is getting everybody behind each other, particularly supporters and encouraging them and, and let them see that we're at least giving it 100% to try and bring success to the club. Well, if there wasn't a sense of optimism, would change the people that didn't have that uh, opinion. You know, one thing in football, you've got to be optimistic, you've got to look forward and uh, you've got to be enthusiastic. And uh, if you're not like that, if you're always looking on the downside, uh, you'll never progress. And one thing we try to breed is good spirit, and uh, you need to be optimistic uh, in any level.